Yes, I like growth. Right, okay. Uh, Minglava along along the day uh, nearly, or the bearing surgeon, they go now along Bono, the Norodine, Tolahima, Pawin, Nere, Seari, Siamari, along with Siadinia, Nibiro, Minglava, Lule, no consulate, separate, Lele, you like Barre. Along Kulu, Pawin, P, Nijari, Dresia, Nine, Tonoru, Nine, Poly, Piduri, Nine. Tola ye di ma pawen ni re tu di alo ni ne kulum yu son lo son zabi pawen ni re siya wen siya ma tu na biu chama yi wen na apam alo ngu tu be jizu ten yang li piu jang le siya ni ne di niya ma piu le pare piu jang mare. I would like to, uh, what I'm saying is I would like to say uh, same to them, we have a great respect to them all, I mean who are working on ground and, you know, even, you know, risking and giving their life and then, uh, you know, working for the people of Myanmar and for revolution. I, I, I'm paying respect to them. And uh, I, I'm introducing uh, uh, the uh, Lauren Mathieu and uh, from the uh, fans, uh, he's going to give a lecture on external fixation of war related injury and compartment syndrome. And uh, that is very important topic that, uh, you know, daily we've been facing, you know, uh, uh, injury, a war related injury, I mean, plus injury and bullets injury, and then, you know, limbs and compartment syndrome. That's, that's why this is very important. And uh, as you all know, uh, uh, we, we already have uh, six uh, topics. And then today is, uh, I think, seventh topic that we are talking and organizing uh, with the uh, our friends and then our uh, leaders uh, from the friends, uh, Professor Jerome C. Dikozi. He's here and he's organizing all these uh, activity and, uh, you know, CME program for us and then uh, and also today. Uh, uh, Professor Lauren Matsu will talk about the external fixation and compartment syndrome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Jerome and then Lauren. Uh, with with uh, your support, I'm, uh, 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 our revolution we win. And then thank you so much for your support and standing with the people of Myanmar and standing with us. Thank you. And now flow is yours, Lauren. Okay, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure for us to help you as we as we can. Um, so I will try to share my screen now. Is it okay? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Ah, okay. 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 So first talk, the the longer one, it will be about the external fixation principles for. Uh, combat-related extremity injury. So first we start with this example of a patient who, um, uh, sorry, oh, yes, who were uh, wounded by, uh, who sustained uh, gunshot wounds of both uh, lower limbs. As you can see, he sustained a, a, a below knee amputation on, on the right side and a very severe open tibia fracture on, on, the, on the left side with uh, both soft tissue and bone defects. So he was admitted in the hospital for definite for treatment at day, day five. It's like usually, like often in uh, context of war, the, the, the ideal treatment cannot be done. So this patient arrived after five days. Then as we have seen uh, last, last week, we perform uh, the DCO procedure with debridement, irrigation, and external fixation, we'll talk about this today, with uh, a delayed primary closure. So we let the wound open on the left side. And uh, on the contrary, the, the stump closure was performed on, on the right side. Then uh, thanks to the, the external fixator, we moved to the definitive fixation and the reconstruction, as you can see, relatively early because the wound was clean. At the first revision, the wound was clean, so we could perform a, uh, the first step of bone reconstruction using the masculine technique. We can, I think we can 
uh, have a lecture on this technique uh, in a few weeks and soft tissue reconstruction uh, also and skin grafting. So as you can see in this, uh, in this situation, there is no other option than the external fixator because the, of the delay management with potential uh, infection and because of the severity of the soft tissue injury, uh, we choose this kind of fixator, which provide a good access to, to soft tissue. So in fact, there are many kinds of uh, external fixators, uh, all have in common to have pins placed inside the bone, proximal and distal to the fracture site and joined together with a frame. And, which, and the frame can be very different. You can have a, a monolateral frame, like uh, uh, in the left, the, the, the two on the left, you can have a multi-planar frame combining uh, uh, various uh, uh, plan of fixation, like in the middle. You can have a, a circular frame on the right and hybrid also uh, external fixator combining uh, the circular uh, frame and uh, standard uh, pins. The purpose of the external fixator is to create a, a, a kind of exoskeleton, a metallic exoskeleton that will bridge the, the fractures and maintain the position of the bone during the healing process. Of course, compared to a nail or plate, it's not, it's not the best mechanical solution since the, the stabilization is uh, lateral and far from the bone. The advantage uh, compared to, uh, for example, um, uh, an internal fixation that uh, it, it can it provide an efficient uh, uh, reduction, main, maintenance of bone alignment, length and rotation of the bone. You can uh, access to the soft tissue, you can manage the soft tissue uh, issue with your fixator. The fixator, uh, uh, must be also uh, comfortable. But the problem, uh, sometimes it can be demanding to uh, implant a, a definitive external fixator, which will provide bone union. You can have some risk of vascular or nerve injury, so you have to know exactly where to uh, implant the pins. And the pins will be, uh, it's, uh, always the, it's always the time, all, the pins always give problem with the times, with a pins infection or pins loosening, we will we will see that. So um, the ex external fixator for war trauma. Uh, what is the its principle? The principle is to is to stabilize uh, all uh, types of fracture in uh, all an anatomical location. This fixator for war trauma must be uh, fast and minimal invasive technique and and easy to apply. Uh, it should be it, the advantage, it, it will uh, minimize bleeding and soft tissue damage. And compared to internal fixation, uh, it will uh, expose to a low risk of infection. So it is in, indicated in all kinds of uh, severe open fracture. This external fixator, as I said, must be easy to apply. So it can be, it should be used by non-specialized surgeon, by a general surgeon, not only auto surgeon. It must be a simple fixator. Uh, it should be a mono or multi-planar fixator to uh, give a good access to the wound. For example, circular external fixator are not adapted because you cannot manage any uh, soft tissue issue if you have a, a circular frame. This uh, fixator should be modular, meaning you, you should place the pin freely wh where you want, according to the soft tissue defect, according to the, to the, 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 the fracture also. And it should be evolutive, uh, meaning that if you use a temporary external fixator, you can uh, change this to a, a definitive frame without changing all the fixator. This is the, actually, this uh, principle are the NATO standards for external fixation. So uh, because of this, modular external fixator are mostly used because as I said, uh, and as you can see in, the, in this example, they uh, allow uh, free placing of the pins. They are easy to, evolve, uh, 
easily uh, evolutive and uh, they are uh, compatible with uh, later procedure, particularly soft tissue and bone reconstruction. So now, <coughs> sorry, we will see the general principle of external fixation. What are the requirements and what are the complications, especially regarding the pins? So when you apply an external fixator, you, there are three uh, uh, requirements, anatomical requirements, functional, and uh, mechanical. Anatomical requirements uh, are regarding the, the, the pins insertion. You, of course, have to have a good understanding uh, of the anatomy of the lower or upper extremity uh, before applying the pins in a safe corridor. You should avoid uh, vascular and neurological damage. You should also uh, avoid pin implantation close to joint, especially uh, near to the knee. It's a frequent mistake uh, because you have a, a risk of septic arthritis and joint stiffness if your uh, pins, uh, like this one, are very uh, are inside the, the capsular joint. So it's crucial to uh, to be aware that uh, the pins must be outside the joint. It's very important. Uh, muscle transfixion uh, must also be uh, avoided uh, when possible. You have here an example of uh, external fixation of the femur. On the, on the left side, you, see, you can see the it's a ICRC uh, picture, it's not mine. Uh, you can see that the pins are uh, transfixing the, the quadriceps muscle. So this will result in a loss of knee flexion because of uh, quadriceps transfixion of the pin. So, so it's, this is not correct. The, the lateral or anterolateral placement is not correct. This is the correct placement for the pins on the, on the femur. The pin should be posterolateral, meaning underneath the uh, vastus lateralis. So uh, not inside the muscle. Like this, the patient can easily uh, flex the knee. So this is important to avoid muscle transfixion uh, when you use uh, uh, definitive external fixator. Uh, <clears throat> in the same in the same way, uh, functional requirements. Uh, you also have to limit, when possible, joint spanning fixation and uh, try to uh, free the joint when possible. So uh, you have here an example of a temporary fixator uh, for for. Um, I think it was a proximal tibia fracture who was temporarily uh, fixed by this frame and moved for the definitive uh, fixation. Uh, it was moved to this circular frame to uh, let, the jo let the knee joint free, to move the, the knee joint. So you have a good example of a, a conversion to a temporary external fixator who have no functional requirement because it will be implanted only for days or two or three weeks maximum. And the conversion to the definitive external fixator we will uh, be uh, used for months until bone union ach uh, is achieved. So uh, other mechanical requirement, uh, <clears throat> the, you, you must understand that the, this, the fixator will uh, bridge the mechanical constraints through the pins and through the frame. So uh, load transfer uh, will be uh, mostly located at the junction of that, at the bone and pin junction and at the uh, pin and frame junction. It's in these two, uh, at these two points that you may have a problem. And you, you have to, to, to check regularly when you use a definitive external fixator that you have no problem on the pins at this level and no problem on the uh, frame. Uh, and regularly you must check the, 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 the clamps is, is tight enough, for example. So mechanical studies show that uh, the highest uh, stiffness, the highest stable uh, 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 position for the pins is to be like in the middle, to be uh, uh, bicortical, of course. This is a, a monocortical fixation is not good. So you must uh, transfix the two cortex and ideally the pins must be in the, in the central location uh, inside the, the bone. And uh, also very important, pins should be uh, 
perpendicular to the bone axis, unlike the, the, the pins B. The pins B is in, in, the, in the middle of the bone, bicortical and uh, perpendicular to bone axis. So this is the right location. <clears throat> then when you will uh, apply your fixator, you will uh, try to have a, it depends if you have, if it's temporary or definitive, and, but it's definitive external fixator, you will try to have a good st 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 stability. And the frame stiffness will depend on two parameters, which is, uh, this is very important to understand. The stability of your fixator will depend on these two factors. The first factor is the bond to bar distance, bond to frame distance, this, this distance. And the other will be the inter-screw or inter-pins distance. We will discuss uh, this. <coughs> As you can see on this, uh, on this drawing, if you want to uh, add the, sti the stiffness, the stability of your, of your uh, fixator, uh, you must uh, separate the, the pins mustn't be too close from each other. The ideal position is this one, with uh, usually when you use a modular fixator for definitive fixation, three pins are, are, are required uh, on each side of the fracture site. And we will see there is a one pin near to the fracture, one far and an intermediate, uh, and the third is in the middle. So this is the highest stable uh, conformation. Other uh, important uh, factor is the bone to tube distance. So if you uh, apply your uh, the bar of the tube, the frame far from the bone, it will be of course less stable then if you apply the, the, the tube uh, close to the bone. If you, if you uh, put the tube on the bone, it's uh, just like a plating, but of course you cannot do that. It, and uh, because you're, it's, a, it's a big tube, it's outside and you have a minimum distance to keep to manage the, to manage the wound. Uh, so you have a wound care, pin care to do. So the minimum distance is one centimeter, ideally we, we prefer to use our finger and the minimal distance is two, two, two finger to, uh, to put the, the dressing and to, to check the wound. So here you, as you can see, you have the different frame and you see that the stabilization is uh, increasing when you, uh, you have three pins and when the bar is uh, relatively close to the bone. So this is the, the standard frame that you should uh, try to do. So the, for definitive uh, fixation, this is the, the, the summary here, of the summary of the ideal uh, uh, definitive uh, frame using a monoaxial uh, fixator. So you have three pins on each side of the, of the fracture side, the N1 tube. You can add a, another tube if you want. If, if, if we need, we will see later. The important is that you you must have uh, th these uh, pins must you have must have pins near to the fracture site, one pins far and pins in the middle. And actually, when you will implant your fixator, you will start by the first the, these pins. The, you will place the two pins, uh, the the farthest pins, then the closer pins, and you you finish by the intermediary uh, pins. The other way to uh, add uh, uh, stability is to add a new plane. So you can start with a, a single plane. For example, in the emergency, you the first day you uh, first play, uh, first um, mono uh, monolateral uh, fixator with one plane is enough. But if you have to uh, reconstruct later a, a bond defect, you will need a, a more stable frame. So you can add another frame. And, and you see here, the, in our practice, we use this kind of frame. In emergency, we use one, one plane, then we add another, and then you, you can connect also the frame together to be very stable. So what are the, the complications that you will have to, to check and to treat with an external fixator? They have uh, four kinds of complications. The, the first and the, the most important is uh, the pin track infection. You can, it will lead also later to pin loosening. And uh, you have uh, 
very often joint stiffness, especially in, uh, in wartime because uh, physiotherapy is very difficult to achieve and you cannot uh, have a very strict follow-up of a patient. And you can also have a delay uh, union or non-union, which is the case of every uh, severe fracture, of course. So first, <coughs> pin track infection. Pin track infection, you cannot avoid that. As long as you use an external fixator, you will have a pin track infection. It's just a matter of time, but if you, you can limit this with a good implantation of the pins. For example, if you, if you, uh, if you make the, if you make a wound incision too small when you apply the pins, or if your wound incision is not right uh, in the exact axis of your pins, it will, it will favorize a pin, pins problem. So you have, uh, usually we, we consider there is three grades of uh, pin track infection. The first one, uh, the grade one is uh, just a peripheral infection, uh, inflammation around the pins or very, uh, very uh, just inflammation. So you just have to adapt the local care. So just to, to clean the wound around the, 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 the pins and uh, apply a proper dressing and that's it. In grade two, you have uh, you, you there is an infection, but superficial, only uh, located to uh, soft tissue. So in this situation, you can uh, make a, a bacteriological sample to your pins and adapt uh, and start uh, antibiotics. Plus, of course, uh, local care. It will be uh, sufficient to uh, to treat the problem. But if you uh, have a uh, grade three, grade three, it's an osteolysis, so the, the infection goes to deep into the bones, then you have no choice to uh, remove your pins and uh, place another pins. Uh, you see in this situation, you have osteolysis on at least two pins on the three. So in this situation, you have no choice than to remove the pins and, and, and change the location of your pins. <clears throat> With the time, uh, it's uh, in, unavoidable also. Uh, with the time, after months, you will have a pin loosening. Pin loosening will be uh, this pin loosening will be uh, related also to pin track infection. If you have infection, you have of course uh, more uh, quickly uh, uh, you have a more quickly uh, loosening. But it also depends on other factor like uh, inadequate implantation. For example, if, as, I, as I told you before, if your pins is not right uh, perpendicular to the bone axis, if it's not bicortical, uh, uh, or if it's not uh, exactly in the center of the bone, this will favorize uh, uh, an early uh, pin loosening. And uh, the last factor, it's uh, excessive, excessive mechanical constraint, uh, like you have here, the example on the, on the on the right uh, picture. Uh, if you have no bone union, if the patient walk, of course, uh, rapidly, you will have a pin loosening like in, in, this, uh, in this case, where the fixator fail before bone reconstruction could be started. <coughs> As a complication is a uh, joint stiffness. As I told you before, this is uh, often due to inadequate pin placement. If your pins are uh, through the muscle or, or inside the joint, you will have, especially for a, a femur frame, you will have a knee stiffness. But it's also, uh, it's mostly due, uh, we have these uh, experiences in, in Africa to the, this is mostly due to the absence of uh, postoperative physiotherapy. So you have to teach to the patient, uh, in this case, to, to flex his knee, uh, as soon as possible after the after the surgery, and and to do it every day, even if he is if if um, uh, he cannot uh, put uh, weight on his on on his limb, if he, uh, his weight bearing is uh, is is provided because of his fracture, he must move uh, when he can uh, the, the the need to avoid this problem, which is a very very big problem in in low resource setting because uh, even if we to the patient, they are sometimes, often they are afraid to, to move their, their knee, for example, by, by, by themselves. So it's, it's a big problem, but uh, I have no solution for that. The, 
last complication you can have, uh, it's not specific to external fixator, it's, but uh, it's, uh, it's due to the fracture severity, it's delay union or non-union. Uh, but uh, this delay union in the case of external fixator can also be due to an, uh, an inappropriate external fixator management in the months following its implementation. Meaning that if you, when you use a very stable frame, like I showed you at the beginning, this stable frame uh, will have a, a, a good stability for the bone. So it, it's good in the, first, uh, in the first month. But after when you, the bone healing process starts, you must, uh, the patient must walk. Way bearing, as you know, is uh, crucial to uh, obtain uh, uh, bone union. But also, you, you also have to uh, perform a, a dynamization of your uh, fixator. It's the same process. You have to uh, progressively uh, increase the mechanical constraint to your bone uh, callus uh, to make it uh, stronger. So uh, it is crucial when you use a, a very stable frame at the beginning to progressively uh, dynamize, uh, uh, reduce the stiffness to uh, obtain a bone healing. So to conclude, you, you understood that uh, any external fixator have a, a limited durability. You, pin infection and pin loosening are unavoidable. So uh, the point is to obtain bone union uh, before the, the fixator fails. So that's why uh, it's very important to uh, wisely use your fixator uh, by uh, dynamizing uh, him, it uh, when you can, and also uh, by using uh, uh, tactical, we, we call that tactical bone grafting, meaning early bone grafting uh, to uh, make the fracture uh, healed uh, as soon as possible before the fixator fails. So now we'll talk about the uh, general principle of external fixator and wall surgery. We saw that uh, last week with the damage control principle and the temporary external fixation uh, rules. So in war trauma, we discussed that last uh, week. You have to deal with open ballistic injury, with the polytraumatic patient, with a mass casualty situation uh, very often, and often also you have to work in an austere uh, environment, which is uh, unfavorable to bone and joint surgery. And in this environment, you have only limited means of bone stabilization. That's why uh, in, the, in the acute setting, external fixator is uh, sometimes the only option you have. So you will use, uh, as we saw, uh, this temporary external fixator, but it's just temporary. So after a few weeks, usually two weeks, you will have to change this temporary external fixator <coughs> either to an internal fixation or to a definitive external fixator. Uh, this temporary external fixator is just a portable correction. We saw that and I will repeat that uh, soon. And if you change to a definitive frame, the aim of the definitive frame this one, is to obtain bone union. Uh, so it's, the, 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 the purpose is not the same. So you have here our, our strategy when in terms of external, external uh, conversion to temporary external fixation. So your temporary external fixator will be changed either to an internal fixation, intramedially nailing or uh, uh, plating, open reduction and internal fixation using plate. And this internal fixation is mostly uh, performed on the upper extremity or for the femur, because as, you, as I showed you, the, you before, uh, ext definitive external fixator of the, of the femur is not ideal and it will bring many problems in terms of uh, knee stiffness and delay union, etc. So when we can, we uh, use internal fixation, definitive internal fixation for the femur and for the upper extremity, because in the upper extremity, the same problem, your fixator cannot provide a perfect uh, reduction and uh, good stability. So this, uh, this tunnel fixation, mostly for the femur and upper limbs. On the contrary, for the tibia, uh, the first example I, I show you in introduction, 
we will move to a definitive external fixator because uh, there is a high risk of uh, infection and you, have, you will have to reconstruct the soft tissue and sometimes to perform bone grafting. So this definitive external fixation is mostly chosen for tibial fracture. So when you use <coughs> a definitive external fixator, uh, the purpose is to achieve bone union, okay, with an optimal functional outcome, meaning with uh, uh, you must avoid joint stiffness. So to do this, you must respect the three uh, requirements I show, I explained to you, the anatomical requirements, the functional, of course, to avoid the knee stiffness, for example, and the mechanical requirements, mechanical requirements to uh, permit bone union. But when you use the Temporary frame, as we uh, discussed uh, last week, the aim is only to provide provisional, provisional stabilization awaiting uh, the definitive treatment. So, of course, you must respect the uh, anatomical requirements for pin implantation, but uh, you have no more functional requirements since you will change your fixator after a few days. And the mechanical requirements are specific. You, are not, you don't need a very stable frame, just need a portable traction. We discussed that a uh, few days ago. So you have here the indication for this temporary external fixator within a damage control orthopedic procedure. You use that for polytrauma, you use that for a very severe injury, open fracture, fracture with vascular injury or multiple fracture. And what is the purpose today? We use that in uh, austere environment in case of war because uh, uh, primary management is not performed under ideal condition. So I show you already this. Your temporary external fixator is just a, a portable traction with only uh, two pins on each side of the bone and one tube. Okay, and when you can, you try to uh, implant the pins far from the fracture side to avoid uh, in infection uh, near to the fracture. For example, if you want to to put a, to convert your extend, uh, your frame to a, a secondary plating. So this is the, when you want to do a plating, uh, ideally the, the pins on, uh, when you implant the fixator must be uh, placed uh, far from the place uh, where you, we will implant the, your plate. I show you already this example. So uh, damage control applied to, um, Ballistic fracture of the femur. So the first day in the in the emergency in austere environment, temporary stabilization with a very uh, simple fixator to permit the evacuation of the patient, and then secondary internal fixation. I show you. I tell you again for femur, you must uh, convert the fixator as soon as you can. Don't let a, a fixator on a femur very for a long time because it will bring you many problems. So as soon as you can, you remove the fixator and you uh, put a nail. On the contrary, at the tibia, uh, nailing is very risky in this kind of situation, a gunshot wound. I, I also show you this case uh, last week. In our practice, we prefer to move to a definitive external fixation. And uh, as you can, just can see here, how we change the fixator, the temporary fixator, very simple, two pins, one bar, and then we move to a multiplanar uh, fixation, external fixator by adding another plane. Uh, we also, we didn't see here because we, the, the day we performed the flap, we, we connect the, the two bar together and we also add this uh, foot fixation because the, the patient had the foot drop because of destruction of, because of the destruction of the extensor. So now we will see a technical issue regarding pins insertion, you got regarding frame reconstruction, and I will give you some tricks for uh, post-operative care in patient with external fixate. Uh, concerning pins, you can have uh, various uh, diameter of pins. You must adapt this to the fracture site, if it's upper or lower limb, but also to the, to the patient. Of course, the, the diameter of the pins is not the same for an adult and for a kid, for a child. Uh, there are different kinds of pins. You have classical 
classical pins it depend on what you have in your hospital so with classical pins you have to drill uh, before prior to put the pins uh, in our practice we use if you can it's better to have self drilling pins so ready to implant no need to to drill before implanting the the pins it's a much more easier and you you have also conical pins conical pins you can you see here uh, these pins permit a, a good stability but there's a big problem when you use that uh, because if you go too far for example if you if you want to remove your your pins you cannot because if you remove you will have no more stability so if you can use uh, standard pins uh, self drilling pins this one for example okay uh, it's a self drilling and it's not conical it's uh, easier to use so once again it's very important your pins must be bicortical it must be central inside the bone and perpendicular to the uh, axis of the bone so this uh, the b uh, b pins is the right one here so the pins insertion can be uh, done using a hand drill. Hand drill, it's recommended sometimes by the by the industry, but uh, in uh, in practice uh, we use power drill. Uh, sometimes it's uh, easier to do it. the The only problem is the risk of uh, overheating of the bone, and this overheating of the bone when you will favorize, of course, uh, pins problem. It will favorize pin infection and later uh, pins uh, loosening. But in an emergency situation, it's uh, easier uh, to use a power drill. It's faster. And sometimes, uh, in my opinion, it's uh, easier to, to feel the two, the two cortex because with the end drill, it's not easy to feel. It's my uh, personal opinion. So go through the two bone cortex, but not too far, of course. Huh? You see here, it's a bit far so you can have a nerve or vessel injury so when you can uh, check your pin placement by fluoroscopy if possible if you don't have fluoroscopy you cannot do this obviously but uh, that's why it's very important to have a good feeling in your hand of the two cortex <coughs> and that's why for a drill is a uh, is better for to do this so when you insert your pin, so you it's uh, it's inside your hand. Huh? The, the, this feeling is very important. You must feel first when you uh, uh, when you move to the near cortex, you will uh, feel uh, uh, high resistance with your drill or your power drill or end drill. Then when your the pins will arrive in the in the marrow, it will be easy to to advance, and then you will have a second resistance. Uh, at the at the far cortex so when you arrive here just slow down your your drill and only do three half turn and usually uh, your pins is uh, exactly at the at the right position not too far so first you pass through the near cortex and when you start to arrive to the far cortex just slow down three half turn and and that's it Uh, very important also, your pins should not be inserted into the wound itself. <coughs> the incorrect position on the, on, the, on the left here, obviously, if you put your pins here, how can you manage the soft tissue uh, later on? It's not possible. So the, your pins must be uh, outside the wound. Huh? Like, uh, like in this example, you see the pins, you, you perform uh, a very elective incision to implant the pins. But the pins is uh, far from the from the wood for obvious, obvious re reasons. So this is uh, the very basic technique how to implant uh, uh, pins. First, you make uh, an incision. You see, one point five centimeter incision. And it's not a uh, it's not five millimeter. It's at least one centimeter incision. Uh, uh, to uh, the same to avoid a uh, skin problem around your pins and a subsequent infection. So make a one centimeter incision. Use, uh, if you have, you can use a special guard to protect soft tissue here. Uh, and then uh, use your, 
use your drill and drill or a power drill to uh, insert the pins uh, in the right position, which is important. It's to that your pins is uh, your pins must be centered inside your wound incision. Then you will have, once you have implanted your pins, you will have to construct your frame. <coughs> so in terms of uh, modular, uh, in term, in term, when you use a modular external fixator for um, a temporary or definitive frame, you have two techniques. Uh, you can choose between two techniques. I will describe this, the modular technique or the monoaxial side tube technique to perform your reduction and, and stabilization. As you can see, in, in both cases, you, have, you only have two pins, but the frame is different. In this case, you have only one tube. In this case, you have three short tubes connect together. So the modular technique is, uh, the principle is to use the, to do, to separate a short frame and to use that as a handle to reduce the, the fracture. And then once the, the fracture is uh, reduced with your hand and you use a third tube to connect the, the, the two first, and that's it. Uh, this is a good uh, technique when you, when you want to uh, stabilize, for example, uh, a femur. Uh, and if you don't have a orthopedic table, a traction table, sorry. So uh, you, can use, uh, you can use this technique. If you don't have uh, access to the bone, uh, example at the, at, the, at the femur, use this technique. Here an example <coughs> of modular frame in a polytrauma patient, you see for the femur, uh, it, was a, it was a close fracture, but the patient was unstable. So we, we performed DCO because he, we couldn't, he couldn't support uh, internal fixation. So, uh, in this case, the, we perform this modular frame uh, with two handles and we reduce the fracture uh, approximately, of course, on just traction. And then we connect the two handles uh, together with a, a short uh, connector, uh, a third uh, tube. So this is a uh, modular technique is very, uh, very useful in this kind of situation, but of course the reduction will be uh, approximately. The other technique is the monoaxial side tube technique. There are two possibilities to, to, to do this method. The first is to use uh, axial traction, osteotaxis. The principle is to uh, implant the, the two pins far from the, from the fracture at first. You connect the, 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 the pins to the, um, to the tube at least one pin, and then you uh, perform uh, <coughs> axial traction, and then you tighten the, 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 the second pin, and then you have uh, restored the length and rotation, and then you just have to add one or two pins according if it's a, a temporary or definitive frame. Here an example, so uh, of this uh, monoaxial side tube technique, side tube, first you implant freely your, your two first pins far from the fracture here. Then you connect to the tube. You just tighten the first clamp. You just you let the second one free. You will help perform the axial traction. It will reduce the, the fracture. And, and once you have the good length, when it's reduced, you lock the second clamp. And, and, and then after you, so you add the, near pins and uh, mid pins if we if uh, needed uh, so at first the the far then the near pins and to finish the, the middle pins this is a uh, very useful for the for the tbi as you can as you can show here <coughs> the other method for uh, a monoaxial side tube technique is the easier one it's uh, it's the open reduction and when you have an open fracture to treat. This allow a perfect reduction because you can also use uh, forceps. So uh, the, the classical, uh, the typical case here of uh, Gustilo uh, II uh, injury of the, of the tibia. So we perform debridement, uh, bone and wound irrigation. 
and then we have a very good access to the to the fracture but we decide to implant a fixator so we use uh, forceps in this case a, a plate just to reduce perfectly the fracture and then we implant the the x fix and as you can see in this case you can obtain a perfect uh, reduction so this uh, this technique is very useful for all open fracture which is uh, uh, which are the vast majority of fracture in in war surgery so what are my advice in terms of post operative care uh, pin site should be uh, covered by separate uh, gauze com gauze compress it's uh, very important not to use fat dressing because uh, fat dressing will preclude wound drainage and favorize wound infection. So you must perform a standard dressing uh, only uh, with cleaning using saline and standard compressed gauze, that's it. This dressing must be changed every uh, two or three days until uh, you have a complete wound healing. And in austere environment, when, when you will discharge the patient from the hospital, uh, patient will have no access to nurse most of the time. So you, you have to give him appointment uh, two or three times a week to check his fixator and to clean yourself by, by, your, by your team, the, the pins to avoid the uh, uh, problems. So it's, uh, this is very crucial to have a very strict and uh, rigorous uh, post-operative care to avoid the pin uh, issues. You must also, after two or two or three weeks, once the skin is healed around the around the, the pins, no need to continue uh, local care in the hospital. So you have uh, to teach to the patient how to clean his fixator. Uh, he can clean this fixator very uh, easily during the during bad time uh, using soap and uh, a clean uh, clean cloth, like you can see here. Okay, so it's very important to teach him how, uh, that he can, he have to, not he can, he have to uh, wash his fixator uh, during the, the bath. To, uh, <clears throat> uh, to favorize, to obtain a bone, uh, bone, un bone union in terms of uh, definitive external fixation, you will have to perform, as I told you, a progressive dynamization in the months following the, 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 the fracture. Uh, so uh, this progressive uh, dynamization uh, must be done uh, very progressively and uh, must be done uh, while you, uh, with, by adapting also, sorry, weight bearing. So uh, at first you see, when you start with the uh, very stable frame, you, when you decide to start weight bearing, you teach the patient to, uh, with the time, to increase very uh, progressively for on a month or on six weeks, uh, the weight bearing. So once the patient can have full weight bearing with, uh, with the frame, without no, no pain, meaning it's the time to dynamize the fixator. Then you, you remove the progressively one bar, so you remove the, the connecting bar and you start from the beginning. At first, the way bearing is not allowed and progressively the patient will uh, uh, put a weight on his uh, limb and progressively until he, uh, he have full way bearing. And once again, when the, he, have, he can uh, full bear on, the, on his foot without pain, it's probably time you, you perform an X-ray to, to, to check, of course, the bone union it's time to uh, dynamize again the fixator. So you, you remove one plate, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and so on, until he, he, you remove completely the, the, the fixator. So this dynamization is very crucial to, to permit uh, bone union. So <coughs> now I will show you, uh, I, I will move relatively quickly on this part because it's only example of this technical uh, issue how to implant uh, uh, pins uh, according to the, to the bone you want to stabilize and how to perform a, a temporary and definitive frame on, on various locations. So it's just example, uh, you, will be, you will have access to this uh, presentation so you can 
uh, you will be able to 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 check if you want later to 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 see the, the this advice. So I will uh, I will go uh, very quickly. Uh, at the lower extremity, uh, the, the main indication for external fixation in war, uh, especially at the in in emergency, it's lower extremity. In upper extremity, you can often do with uh, a splinting, uh, except if you have a vascular injury. But the lower extremity, you have no choice than to use a external fixator. So you have you have to know these four frame: uh, the femur frame, the tibial frame, the knee spanning frame, and the ankle spanning frame. So I will show you the uh, how to uh, how to do this frame. Regarding femur diaphyseal uh, fracture technique, so uh, what is the pertinent anatomy? You uh, you must avoid uh, to injure the the femoral uh, vessels, which are uh, medial, and the sciatic nerve, which is posterior. As I told you before, you should also avoid uh, transfixion of the vastus lateralis. So your pins must be underneath the vastus lateralis. The pins must be posterior uh, laterally. Very crucial to avoid joint stiffness to the knee. Rem uh, you must keep in mind that the the the, the fracture the femur shaft is uh, is not uh, straight. Huh? There is a curvature. So when you implant your pins, uh, this one and this one will not be exactly at the same level. Uh, if not, you see they will be uh, they will the E and C are will be at the level at the same level, but because of the curvature the B should be a, a, a little bit uh, anterior. If not, you will, have, uh, you will have this problem. You will have a, a pin, which is not uh, rightly in the center, and maybe you will face later a problem on that pin. So it's important to uh, anticipate that when you implant your, your pins. There is a, the B cannot be at the same level than A and C because of the femur uh, curve. So I already show you the <clears throat> temporary external fixation of the, the femur. So you have here the example of the two kinds of frame you can use for this temporary external fixation, the modular technique. Okay, you use the two, two short tube using as a handle and you connect with the third tube. And this technique, the monoaxial technique uh, with, uh, <coughs> you can, uh, also have a, a good alignment using this, huh? uh, but it's better to use that with a traction table. If you have, if you don't have, you can also do it with a, uh, with your help. Uh, with the monoaxial technique, it's a, it's a close fracture also, and we didn't access to the, the fracture. Uh, first, the, the four pins make traction, you lock your clamp and you add a, a second pin. Okay, so the, for an adult, you have to use five or six millimeter pins and relatively uh, big tubes. It depends, or it depends on the, on the brain of the, the x fix. Most of the time with the Hoffman or other brain, you have no choice of the, of the tube. So forget that, use a use tube, okay? And pins of five, this is important, five or six millimeters. And if you want to move to a definitive uh, external uh, fixation, so you have to add pins at minimum three pins, and you can uh, add uh, also another tube to have a, a good stability. But we, we did this in this case because we have an infection, but when you can avoid a definitive uh, external fixation of the femur because it's, it's very complicated to obtain bone union like this. And in this case, we were lucky we had a bone union, but in most cases, uh, we have problem on the pins. We have uh, the reduction is not perfect because the femur is not straight and it's because of the curvature. So definitive external fixation of the femur is very complicated. So if you can avoid this. <coughs> <coughs> now for, uh, how to stabilize a, a tibia fracture. For the tibia, it's uh, much more easily because the tibia is a straight bone and uh, the medial aspect is uh, very superficial. 
So it's very easy to place the pins here. The danger if you place the pin medially is the anterior tibial bundle vessels, which are here. But you can also, I think, yes, the other option is to uh, put the pins anteriorly. It's another option. This is my favorite because using this, you can have access to both sides of the leg to, to perform a flap, for example. Uh, if you use a, if you implant your fixator on the medial side, it can be more complicated to perform flap. So in my practice, I prefer uh, anterior placement. <coughs> if you, it's a little bit more difficult because you can slide on the uh, tibial crest, but with uh, uh, it's not so difficult. So uh, I advise you to place the pins anteriorly. In this case, the, the danger will be the, the posterior uh, tibial uh, vessels and, and nerve. So here an example of a temporary frame, mod modular frame here. Once again, two pins. Five millimeter are enough, and you use a tube. So here you have an example of a, a modular technique uh, with uh, the Z frame with the, the two short uh, tube connected with the third tube. And in this case, the pins were uh, implanted uh, medially. This is the. I think this is the same. This is the same patient. We change. So don't they really the, the pins for uh, an entire placement uh, because uh, here you can see it cannot walk. Huh? You have the, this is a temporary frame, but the, the, the other leg is here, is on, on this side. So it's not easy to walk like this. So that's why we, we change. So one of the reasons why we change also because there's an infection. So we, we couldn't put a, a nail. So we, but we uh, use a definitive uh, frame with anterior placement. With the anterior placement, no problem. You can walk easily. Uh, and if you have a heavy patient or if you have a bone loss, you can uh, add a second uh, tube, for example. <coughs> and if you have a very large defect, like in this case, or you, we have a. This is cement, huh? this is not bone. We had in this case to face a 12 centimeter defect. So we use a B planar frame combining an entire plane and a medial plane. So this is, a, I will show you this example when we will talk about the bone reconstruction in this frame, B planar frame with a connective tube is very stable and permit the reconstruction of large defect. So in this case, you have to use the, 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 the two plane, anterior and medial. Now spending knee uh, fixation, it's uh, easy to do. You just have to uh, uh, connect a posterior lateral frame and anterior tibial frame with a, a connecting uh, bar. Usually two are required to, to have a, a good stability. So at uh, 10 or 20 degree of flexion, depending on the, on the injury, of course. But you see, uh, important, the posterior lateral on the femur and anterior, uh, not medial, because medial, you, you cannot connect to the, to the lateral side, anterior, and you use a connecting uh, bar. Here is an example <coughs> of a patient victim of a, a landmine. It was amputated on one side and we a very severe injury on, on, the, on, the, on the other limb. We, of course, try to save the limb, uh, considering the uh, amputation on the opposite side. So here, the, the, the DCO procedure with the temporary external fixator, fixator you can see with a knee spanning fixator. And in this case, uh, sorry, we, and uh, in this case, we, we use three pins here because we, we have the idea that the, we cannot uh, uh, put a plate or something like that. And this patient has later on a definitive external fixation. Now the spanning ankle technique, uh, how to uh, fix the ankle. <clears throat> so the, for the tibia, it's the, it's the same. So, but for the, for the calcaneus, 
you will uh, you have to use this technique is the 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 the, the simple the I think it's the most simple to perform. Uh, you can do this without uh, fluoroscopy. So in terms of ankle fixation, I advise you to do this frame, the uh, tibial and calcaneus frame. So for the calcaneus, you use a transfixing uh, pins that you will uh, insert uh, from medial to lateral to avoid, uh, to sever your tibial uh, vessels and nerve. So transfixion pins must, must be inserted from medial uh, to lateral. And then uh, you use this, uh, <clears throat> this, this delta configuration, we call that, we, using uh, an anterior tibial frame and your transfixing calcaneus pins. And then you connect this with two connecting bar, you uh, forming like this a delta. It's the delta frame. So an anterior tibial frame and a transversal calcaneal pins connect by two uh, cross tube. It's a very useful frame for all uh, ankle fracture, distal tibial fracture. Here an example of uh, <clears throat> fragment injury during a uh, bombing. The patient had a very big uh, fragment inside the distal tibia. And then we uh, stabilized using this frame, which was uh, in this case, uh, we plan to put him uh, for the, as a definitive fixation. So, because we were not in, uh, we were in very austere condition. So we use uh, three pins and, uh, and the calcaneus frame and the delta frame like this. It's a uh, very easy to, to do and you don't need any, uh, uh, fluoroscopic uh, uh, C-arms, sorry, to, to check your, your frame. And then, of course, you can combine all this frame together uh, when you have a very severe injury. Uh, you have the, the knee spanning frame, but you can uh, connect your knee spanning frame to, uh, to ankle frame, so you can fix all the lower limb if you want. Now we'll finish by quick presentation of uh, stabilization of upper extremity fracture, which is uh, uh, less frequent because in the, in the emergency, you can use splints, it's enough. And after for definitive fixation, uh, plating is much more uh, convenient, but uh, sometimes you have no choice than to use a, an X-fix. Here's a good example. You have a very severe open fracture of the humerus with a uh, vascular injury. So. You know, the patient has to, we have to perform a revascularization. So in this case, no choice than to uh, perform an, an external fixation. So for the humerus, use a lateral frame. You see the diameter of the pins must be ideally five, uh, four centimeter or five maximum, but don't use a larger pins. If not, you, you will have fracture on your, on your pins. A structure at risk are the radial nerves and, uh, and the axillary nerve also. And uh, of course, the, all the vessels which are in the, in the, in the brachial uh, uh, area. Avoid biceps and triceps transfixion. It's obvious to, to avoid uh, uh, because it's uh, your uh, make, uh, functional requirement. So the, the safe zone, <clears throat> the safe zone are in green here and the danger zone are in red. So uh, this zone, uh, the radial nerve is at risk, and here the axillary nerve is at risk. So, so you can, uh, it's uh, more, less dangerous to put the pins in this zone, but most of the time you have no choice of the place where you want to put the pins. So be, for this reason, I advise you, whatever the, 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 the zone you choose to implant your pins, perform a, a small approach, a real approach uh, with a retractor and you see the, the, the bone, you see the nerve if you here, if you're here, and then you can uh, uh, implant your pins uh, uh, safely uh, regarding to the nerve. So always make an approach uh, uh, of five centimeter with a retractor and you, you, you see what you do when you implant the pins. Uh, that's the, the safer way to do in my opinion. So I already show you this patient. This patient also had a, a femur, uh, femoral fracture. You see the, 
the path of the of the radial nerve. In this case, we perform a percutaneous in insertion because we were in safe zone. It was a temporary fixation that will convert later to internal fixation. <coughs> Here is a gunshot wound of the of the humerus. Here is the the, the path of the nerve, axillary nerve and radial nerve. We were here also in safe zone, so we could perform uh, percutaneous pin insertion. And in, in this case, it was the, the definitive uh, external fixation until the bone union was achieved after three months. So this is a, a good example of to manage a complex fracture in an austere environment with a very simple uh, fixator. But if you have any doubt of your the location of the nerve, don't hesitate to uh, perform a, an incision and to uh, and to approach the bone directly. For uh, the forearm, <clears throat> the indications are very 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 few. Huh? It's very rare to have uh, to put a external fixator on the forearm. But uh, in this case of uh, a blast explosion, you we had to do so. For the radius, you use the, a, a lateral frame most of the time. <coughs> you see the pins must be smaller again, three millimeters better, maximum four. And the structure at risk are radial nerve branch and tendon. So it's the same. Uh, you see the danger zone here. Uh, danger zone is uh, almost everywhere. So uh, you have to, uh, if you want to put your pin safely, always perform a mini approach to. Uh, retract the tendon, retract the nerve. <coughs> so for the ulna, the uh, pin placement must be posterior on the ulnar crest. Also three or five or uh, four millimeter pins. And there, there is no structure at risk, maybe a tendon, but it's not a big deal. So here it's a safe zone and you can implant your pins without any approach percutaneously uh, very easily. So once you have a, a <clears throat> radial frame and a ulnar frame, you can have two separate frame if you want to uh, preserve rotation, which is which is very seldom. Most of the time, you will lock the rotation uh, using a third bar. Or alternatively, you can you can use a temporary frame connecting the the ulna to the radius. It's another option, but this one is only temporary, of course. Uh, <clears throat> then after you, it's very frequent in war surgery to have to, to deal with uh, elbow fractures, severe elbow fractures. So uh, elbow frame is important to know. Uh, you, it's uh, elbow frame, it's a humeral ulnar frame. So you will uh, combine a lateral humeral frame and a posterior ulnar frame, as I show you. Uh, the structure at risk is the radial nerve at the humerus level. Here is example. So you, you can use a, a, a lateral frame. So you implant your pins laterally on the, on the ulna and laterally, of course, on the, on the, on the humerus. Or either you can uh, use a posterior frame. You can also implant your pins posteriorly in the, in the humerus, but be, be careful of the nerve first. And second, uh, I told you, do not uh, transfix the triceps. So if you use this frame, this frame is of course only a DCO frame. Huh? Don't use this as a, temp as a definitive frame, huh? but it's possible. <clears throat> Here is a definitive frame. The definitive, the classical definitive frame is like this with lateral, uh, Humerus uh, pins. You have here the the path of the nerve. Uh, you, you, this one has a, a multiple fracture, so uh, we put percutaneously in safe zone, and we uh, combine this to a posterior lateral ulnar pins. And to finish the <coughs> wrist uh, spanning wrist uh, frame using uh, three milliliter uh, pins. The structure at risk are the tendon and the, the superficial branch of the radial nerves. And to, to, to stabilize a wrist, you have to combine a lateral uh, radial uh, frame 
hein, to uh, a lateral uh, metacarpal frame on the, on the second uh, metacarpal bone. Here is an example. It was for end replantation, but anyway, uh, use uh, two, two radial uh, pins and two uh, metacarpal pins. Uh, but uh, my advice is to uh, put the pins until the the third metacarpal because if you let only in the second, you will it will not be uh, enough stable. So put your pins far to the to the third metacarpal. And once again, you're here in this polytrauma patient uh, where we perform a DCO, you can combine uh, uh, all this frame from the humerus to the, to the wrist. Okay, this patient has very multiple fracture with also brachial plexus injury and subclavian arterial injury. So at the beginning, we perform this DCO procedure and we remove uh, the fixator later on to perform internal fixation of all this fracture. So it's, it's done. Uh, what you must uh, understand that it's in terms of war, DCO always apply when you have to uh, manage a patient in hostile condition. So DCO is either uh, temporary external fixation, mostly for the lower extremity, but you can also use splinting at the upper extremity, except in case of, of you have uh, to perform, for example, uh, uh, to have to treat a vascular injury. So in this case, you have no choice to use also external fixator to upper extremity fracture. When you can, uh, this, uh, this uh, sorry, this temporary external fixation will have to be converted to a definitive fixation as soon as possible. This definitive fixation can be either internal or external. Uh, if you can use internal fixation, uh, definitive internal fixation for femur and upper limbs fracture, but for tibia, uh, my advice is to use definite, definitive external fixation because it's more safer regarding to the infection risk. And because of the tibia, you almost have all the, almost all the time have to have to deal with uh, uh, soft tissue injury to perform soft tissue reconstruction and bone reconstruction also. So thank you very much for this long <laughs> lecture. I will try to move to a second one immediately, and then we think we can discuss later. Uh, can I, can I